Okay. Welcome to our Maundy Thursday service tonight. Tonight we remember Jesus washing his disciples' feet. We remember Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. And tonight our theme is this, calling out to God in times of fear, from fear to faith. And Pastor Hinky will have the sermon this evening. This is a special night, a sacred night in Holy Week. This is also the night in which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was betrayed, betrayed to death for us. And of course, tomorrow will be Good Friday with our Good Friday worship services. So we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Psalm 116, verses 12 through 19. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, in this wondrous sacrament, you have left us a remembrance of your passion. Grant that we may so receive the sacred mystery of your body and blood, that the fruits of your redemption may continually be manifest in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for it will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt." This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 32. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now rise for the holy gospel reading. The gospel reading according to St. Mark, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now sing our sermon hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we gather together on this Monday, Thursday, let's begin in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, once again we bow before you, giving you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, who died upon the cross so that we might have forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation. Just as your Son gathered together with the disciples on Monday, Thursday, in celebration of the Last Supper, so also, Lord, we gather together this night, seeking your blessings. Help us, dear Lord, to be ever mindful that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are there in the midst of them. Keep us mindful, dear Lord, that the Holy Spirit, Jesus promised to send to the disciples, is the same Holy Spirit who dwells within our hearts now as we gather together this night around your word and sacraments. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Beloved in Christ, as we come together this Monday, Thursday, there's an important question I'd like to have you ask yourself. What is it that keeps you awake at night? Many of us would have to admit during the stressful times that with all the discussion of COVID-19 on the news, whether it's the first thing we hear in the morning when we wake up or the last thing we hear when we go to bed at night, it causes us to be anxious. It causes us to be stressful. It causes us to be fearful. Perhaps, perhaps there might be something else that's keeping you awake at night. With all the activity that we had in the past, storm activity and the rains that we've had in the past and the tornadoes that we've had. Many lives have been upset and disrupted because of the tornadoes. And some, some of us might be wondering or lying awake at night wondering when the next storm is going to be rolling in. All kinds of worries and concerns and fears can fill our heart because we are sinful human beings. That's why we need we need to hear God's word again this evening. God's word is revealed by uh, the prophet Isaiah in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 4, and I encourage you to open your Bibles and to reflect upon God's word with me this evening. God's word helps us to reflect upon the theme that we've been reflecting upon throughout Lent. It's calling out to God in times various times of our lives that do cause us anxiety or crises or trial or uncertainty. And this evening, we're reminded to call out to God in times of fear because of, rather than living in doubt, uncertainty and fear and anxiety, God wants us to live in faith. And Christian faith begins and ends as the Holy Spirit works within us, the gift of faith. For no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus spoke to the disciples near the end of his life, the end of his ministry, just prior to his arrest and crucifixion, he promised them that he would not leave them as orphans. His promise extended to you and to me, as he promises send the Holy Spirit the same Holy Spirit that speaks to us tonight through God's Holy Word. So as we reflect upon God's Holy Word, we're drawn to Isaiah chapter 43, beginning at verse 1. But you, or but now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Those words spoken, spoken by the prophet Isaiah are the words of God communicated to the people of God. It's as if our Heavenly Father is speaking to his children in a very personal way. Israel was the chosen people. They were called to be the light, the custodians of God's word, so that salvation, his covenant, might be communicated and conveyed to everyone. You and I as baptized children of God, are called and chosen as well. A holy people. Once we were no people, Scripture tells us, but 
Now we are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. Through the waters of holy baptism, we're baptized in his name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we're blessed. We're blessed in as much as now we don't live merely for ourselves. We don't live with a focus upon sin, with a focus upon that which is darkness and that which is contrary to God's will. No, the Holy Spirit works new life within us through the word and through the sacraments, giving us the forgiveness, giving us God's grace, giving us the strength and the hope to live as his people both now and eternally. So as we listen to this word of God, it's a beautiful comforting message from scripture. You, the Lord says, the Lord who created you, do not be afraid, I have ransomed you. The Lord is speaking to the children of Israel during a turbulent time in their life. They would understand what it means, what it means to be held captive because they would be taken into slavery. They had been taken into slavery by the Persians. And for 70 long years, they'd experienced that. But God reminds them that just as he had redeemed them from Egyptian slavery during the Exodus, so also God would redeem them now from the Babylonian captivity. He would use this as a time for them to grow in his grace, a time for repentance and a time for renewal. God knows the hearts of his people. He knew the hearts of the Israelites, their need for repentance, their need to become disconnected with the sin of this world and to be connected with the things of God, the word of God. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, likewise, when he gathered together in the upper room, was celebrating the Passover, the Passover with these disciples. It was a time to remember, a time to reflect, a time to repent, a time to prepare for, for that time when he would be crucified and taken from them and when he would likewise rise from the dead and enable them and equip them to be his witnesses so that his salvation might be shared with everyone. Jesus said when he was gathered together with these disciples as he broke the bread, partaking, giving and sharing his body to be for the disciples to partake of, blessing the cup and giving thanks to God and sharing with them his true blood. As he was, as he was sharing the sacrament, he told them, do this in remembrance of me. God wants us to remember. He wants us to reflect upon how he has saved us in the past so that we might likewise, in times of present tribulation and trial and fears, look upon him and know that he is a God who saves, a God who delivers, a God who provides. He knows though that it's because of our sinful human nature, there will be times that we struggle with fear, with uncertainty. He knew that with the apostle Peter. Remember how Jesus told Peter on Monday, Thursday that, that as a matter of fact, it says here right in scripture, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. He knew that Peter, when confronted and circled by those who were opposing Jesus, would deny him not once, twice, but three times because of his fear. He knew the hearts of the disciples on an early occasion when they had been in the midst of a storm on the Sea of Galilee they began filling their, their hearts began becoming filled with fear and their minds filled with questions. Does he really love us? Is he really who he says he is? And we see in scripture again, Luke chapter eight, the disciples went and woke him up shouting, master, master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves and suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. And then he asked them, where is your faith? Where is your faith? 
This was a time and an opportunity for the disciples to grow in their faith, to realize that God loves them. That's the same thing you and I can ask ourselves when we're struggling, when we're tossing and we're turning. Jesus asks us, where's your faith? These trials are times and opportunities for us not to panic, not to live in fear, but to grow in faith as we listen to his word, as we turn to him in prayer, using prayer not as a last resort, but again as as an initial outburst of asking God, worshiping God, praising God, seeking God's guidance for our lives. Because God does have the power to save. As he saved people in the past, so also he saves us, even now and all generations to come through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who wants to remind you and me whenever we're feeling overwhelmed, as he reminded the crowds in his own day, what is the price of five sparrows? Two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them, and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Each and every one of us is a precious child of God, created in his image, redeemed by his son. So do not be afraid. Is a message that Isaiah was telling these children of Israel, had experienced the exodus, who had experienced 70 years of Babylonian captivity and had been set free. And it's the same message that God speaks to us today as he calls us in times of fear, from fear to faith. God's word through the prophet Isaiah continues, verse two and following. When you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you'll not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. What profound words of comfort come from from Scripture, from this prophecy of Isaiah? What's he really communicating to us? When you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. Rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. (laughs) And the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. He's looking at the two extremes in life, water and fire. Entirely different ends of the spectrum, like two sides of a coin. What God's communicating to us through this ancient prophecy 700 years before Christ was born is that nothing, there's nothing that we will encounter in life that God cannot use for us to grow spiritually that God is, that's beyond God's control. He can use all things to mold us. He's the potter and we're the clay to mold us more and more as to be Christ-like. C.S. Lewis, a powerful and very gifted author, English author, noted author of Screwtape Letters, Chronicles of Narnia, Mere Christianity, I think 30 books in all. He had also done a broadcast during World War II, and he likewise, as a young man, he was baptized in the Christian faith in Ireland, but then as a teenager, he fell from from the Lord. But then later on, Christian friends shared the love of God with him, and he became a Christian, again, a strong Christian, a strong believer. He acknowledged his sins and his need for the Savior, And he used his books, he used these radio broadcasts in order to help other people grow in their faith. As a matter of fact, showing the effects of daily life and from World War II, how lives were changed, he sets up a little dialogue. In the screw tape letters, he does that. He uses a lot of dialogue in order to to con- communicate some spiritual truths. Well, here he has a conversation between Satan, what Satan says, and what Jesus says during times of conflict. 
such as war, such as disease. Here's what Satan says. Here's his strategy. Satan states, C.S. Lewis writes in 1942, during World War II, I will cause anxiety, fear, and panic. I will shut down businesses, schools, places of worship, and sports events. I will cause economic turmoil. Wow. That's pretty much the checklist for today, isn't it? As we're in our homes to be safe. As our businesses have all been shut down. As the stock market plummets. But then Jesus responds to Satan. And he states, during this time of turmoil, now this is 1942, I will bring together neighbors, neighbors, restore the family unit. I will bring dinner back to the kitchen table. I'll help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. I will teach my children to rely on me and not the world. I will teach my children to trust me and not their money and material resources. People of God, that's exactly what God's doing. He's giving us time now to spend more time together as family. More time to gather around the dinner table and to talk instead of staring at a phone or having having the news on because we're tired of hearing the tragic news that that is there on a regular basis. Instead, we're focusing upon perhaps a family devotion. We're praying together. We're smiling and laughing together and trusting in God and praying for our neighbors and our fellow man in need and looking for ways to be able to help our neighbors who are in need. What God's trying to help us to realize is that don't place your confidence in in finances. All we have to do is look at the stock market. Don't place your confidence in, in your own wisdom and strength to solve your own problems. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Don't place your trust in simply political promises because It might be there one day and gone the next. No, instead, God's inviting us in his eternal word, Psalm 46, 10 and following, be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I'll be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. What a gracious God we have, who reminds us that In times of fear, we can call out to him. He loves us. He promises us, promises to hear us. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. So truly, do not be afraid. No matter what you encounter in life, God is with us. These are the messages that are unfolding from the heart of Isaiah. No, from the heart of God. And the final message that rolls from the lips of Isaiah, is this. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Sheba in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours. Because you are precious to me, you are honored, and I love you. The greatest example of God's redeeming love is Jesus. Here Isaiah uses the term Savior. He talks about the salvation that God provides. Again, we spoke about how God had delivered, miraculously delivered the children of Israel from from captivity, from slavery in Egypt, and we're taking them to the promised land. Again, we're reminded here specifically, Isaiah is talking about again, how God was freeing was in control of history when it came to the freedom of the children of Israel from the Babylonian captivity. The Persians were in control at that point in time. And the Persians, the Persians allowed the children of Israel to leave because 
they had been attacked by Egypt and by parts of Arabia and by Ethiopia. And now they had taken those people and they had replaced the children of Israel who had been their slaves with, with these people who had attacked them and were now their prisoners. And then the Persians allowed the children of Israel to return back to the promised land. And that's what God is saying. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. God saves. He works his salvation, his redemption, whether it's in ancient Egypt or ancient Persia. He works it through all generations for the well-being of the body of Christ, the church of God, the people of God. The greatest example of that is the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, who broke bread with the disciples on Monday, Thursday, who gave the wine his true blood, Do this in remembrance of me. Reminding them and reminding us of the price that he was paying so that we, who once were no people, are now his people, God's people, who had not received mercy, have now again received mercy. And that's why scripture tells us so powerfully and so beautifully through the words of Apostle Paul, Galatians chapter four, verse four, about He speaks about us being set free from slavery, from the power of sin, death, and the devil. When he writes, but when the time, the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. The next time you toss and turn in bed, being afraid, Pray to the Lord. Take time to reflect upon this word and instead grow in faith. Know that God does love us. God is in control. God provides. And the most perfect thing that he's provided for us is his own son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if he's provided that, there's nothing else to be concerned for. As a matter of fact, in Romans 8, verse 32, The Apostle Paul, who experienced beatings, shipwreck, imprisonment, and you name it, all for the sake of proclaiming crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he writes for you and for me to reflect upon. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things. What an amazing God that we have. Think about what Paul's saying, what Paul is writing. If God didn't hold his own son back from us, why would he hold anything else that we need? For we are his children by grace. He's made a covenant with us. A covenant's sealed by the blood of Christ. God bless you as you continue to grow in his grace during this holy week, during your entire life, focusing upon Jesus Christ crucified and risen, the Alpha and the Omega. To God be the glory. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts, keep your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now rise and confess our faith and we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We go to our Lord God, Heavenly Father, in prayer. 
we pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, on this holy night of Maundy Thursday, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, washed his disciples' feet as a servant. He instituted his holy meal, the Lord's Supper, where we partake of his body and blood in, with, and under the bread and the wine. This was also the night in which Jesus was betrayed, betrayed to death on a cross for our redemption, for our forgiveness and salvation and everlasting life. This holy week, Lord God, focus our faith on Jesus Christ and everything that would lead him to Calvary's cross for us. Lord God, we pray for our nation and our leaders during the COVID-19 crisis. Give them wisdom, we pray. May we all seek you in faith and in trust through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord God, Heavenly Father, show your loving mercy towards all those who are battling COVID-19. Heal them, we pray. Lord God, we pray for all those battling illness, sickness, or any type of challenge. Lord God, strengthen them and provide for them with your grace as the great physician of body, soul, and spirit, and as our great provider of all things. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for all of those who are battling fear. Lord, may we cast all our anxieties upon you because you care for us. Lord God, we thank you that through your Holy Spirit, you bring us from fear to faith. Lord God, may we boldly share that faith as a church and as an academy on mission for you through our living, serving, and giving. We now say the prayer Jesus has taught us to pray, and we pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the time in the service that uh, we would normally take up an offering. Of course, we're doing our offering differently uh, with no public worship. And I want to thank you for your faithful giving during this time. There are three main ways that you can give. Number one, and it's probably the best way, is to give online. You can go to our church website, click the Give tab, and there are easy instructions on how to do it from there, and it's a safe way to give as well. I highly recommend this option, online giving. The second thing you can do is just mail it into the church. You can do that. Uh, the third option, you can just drop it off at the church office, and uh, you can give that to someone on staff here, and we'll maintain the social distancing, and uh, we appreciate your faithful giving during this time. Also, just to remind you about our Easter offering, we are going to give it all away. Yes, you heard correctly, we're going to give it all away. We have been so blessed as a church, as an academy. Luke 12, 48 tells us to whom much is given, much is expected. So we're going to give the entire offering away to help our community, which is in need. And here's how it's going to go. 50% of the offering will go to tornado relief in the mid-state through our Mid-South District. So 50% of the offering to tornado relief. Then 25% of the offering will go to end slavery Tennessee, which combats human trafficking. And then the other 25% will go to Inspiritus, which does so much to help needy people in our area. So let's be very generous with our offerings, with our giving, so that we can make a huge difference in the community with the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you.
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him. All you descendants of Israel, 
for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will lead and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth who fear and worship, all who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen.